Hey guys, welcome to book review 150. Today I am going to be reviewing Country Driving, A Journey Through China from Farm to Factory by Peter Hessler. So this is Peter's third book that he wrote uh, while in China. Uh, the first two being Rivertown and Oracle Bones. Um, this book was specifically uh, written kind of later in his uh, period in China um, specifically when he was working as a foreign correspondent uh, in Beijing um, for a number of, I think, like the New Yorker and uh, National Geographic. Um, but what he specifically focuses on this book is sort of the change in everyday life in China uh, among its citizens. And that's really sort of the uh, narrative of China uh, in the opening up uh post uh, uh, Ding Jinping, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, and essentially the economic miracle that's happened in China um, during this time period. Now, a lot of what we see in the West is sort of kind of a, a top-down approach um, that focuses on just a number, like one billion people or um, the amount of manufacturing that goes on in China. Uh, but Peter specifically takes a... Uh, boots on the ground approach um, to uh, delving into people's lives and using the examples that he sees as narratives for uh, what really life in China for the everyday citizen is like. Um, so he focuses on three areas in this book. The first, let me get to the title page. Uh, the first is the wall. And this is where he takes a road trip through um, some of the northern provinces, such as um, Xi, uh, Shanxi and Shanxi, uh, as well as Inner Mongolia uh, and the areas around Beijing, to um, see kind of uh, the wall. This thing that um, we we have the mind or we have this image of of what it is uh, in the West, but uh, in reality is quite different. Uh, a, specific, a specific example that Peter mentioned um, in an anecdote that's uh, often used until it's uh, continually been corrected um, in more recent times is that the wall can be seen uh, from space. Well, if you go along the wall, it looks very beautiful, uh, the restored sections in the areas around Beijing. But uh, even the old Ming walls are largely falling apart and even more prescient than that, um, a lot of the walls that go uh, out into the Ordos, or sort of these vast um, kind of semi-arid plains in north-central China, uh, are the exact same color as the ground that surround them, are often no more than a few feet high. Uh, it's just, uh, it's pretty ridiculous. But that's just one example. Um, he kind of talks uh, also about some of the instances around the wall, um, specifically as the book would mention, it's country driving. And so he buys a, or not buys, it rents um, from, I believe it's not a, a national chain or a international chain like Hertz or uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car or something like that. It's a chain specifically in China. Um, and the reason he does this is because he feels that he can have less restrictions uh, by renting one of these cars. Now, that would seem uh, counterintuitive in that, um, you know, China is known for being a very strict society. But something that uh, Peter mentions in, in the book, in part of Chinese society, is that it's often easier to um, ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Um, and so even though the car that he rents, he says he's only going to keep in Beijing, he goes uh, to remote areas along the wall, uh, extending into the west, um, the Z. Uh, and uh, uh, essentially when he returns the car, they ask him, well, where, why are there so many miles on it? Where have you taken it? Well, he tells them that he takes it out. And then the people that he rented the a uh, car from essentially grumble a little bit and I think they maybe gave him like a very small like $10 fine or something like that. Um, but uh, uh, what else about the the wall? Um, oh, 
when he was out uh, going along the wall, um, he would often, and this is a further example of uh, it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission, or sometimes you don't even need to ask for forgiveness uh, because uh, the authorities can't find out about it, is that um, if you're a foreigner, at least at this time period, you had to register uh, in all the areas that you were going to. Uh, but often what he would do is uh, he rented like a big, like old, almost like an army jeep type situation. Um, and he would essentially camp out in uh, sort of these remote, um, you know, farm deserty areas uh, along the along the wall. Um, it's another specific instance that's mentioned. I'm just kind of mentioning instances in the book. Uh, I should say it's been a while since I've read this book, so I am certainly going to be missing some gaps. But um, one of the stories he told, another story he told was uh, of sort of a small time uh, uh, con scheme um, where in a remote area, uh, but along the highway, um, there was an antique shop. This antique shop, um, was on, what am I gonna say? This antique shop uh, was in a location that you wouldn't think an antique shop would be. Even though it was along the highway, there was no justification for it. Well, he went in there with a, another foreign correspondent and uh, essentially the proprietor of the shop knocked over what was supposedly an ancient artifact, shattering it. Um, at which point uh, the proprietor demanded essentially a bribe from uh, Peter Hessler to not turn him into the police. And it resulted in this huge uh, shouting match um, that ultimately uh, resulted in a small bribe being paid, uh, but just kind of an example of maybe the seamier side of, uh, you know, traveling along the wall. Certainly, uh, we think of authoritarian states as, well, such as China, uh, as having these very tight Orwellian controls on society. But the truth of the matter is, is that China is a sprawling, uh, if not a mess, it's a sprawling country um, that uh, the tentacles of government while at times can be very intense, uh, do not necessarily spread to every single uh, sector of society. Um, what else from the wall? Oh, I guess you mentioned uh, there was this uh, Western um, correspondent who, being four years since I've read this book, I'm not going to remember, but um, essentially kind of lost his uh, or destabilized his family situation and kind of... Uh, didn't go into poverty, but essentially was downwardly mobile uh, by being so obsessed with walking every part of the wall and seeing it and documenting it. And I hope wherever that guy is, um, he is uh, fulfilled his dream of being the true, uh, uh, you know, expert source of everything having to do with the wall. Not that there aren't already experts out there, but you know, sometimes you got a dream and uh, you want to fulfill it. The second book is about uh, the village, and this is uh, what we might call for Peter a um, bedroom community, though maybe not even like a bedroom community, almost like a dacha uh, in the uh, Soviet style, in that it's a place you could escape to, a small uh, apartment or house that you could escape to uh, in the weekends in this specific instance outside of Beijing. Um, and what was really kind of fascinating about this was with all the change uh, in Beijing, um, with fashion, cars, uh, which I guess I'll, I'll get to in a little bit, uh, cover more on that, really sort of the people that lived in this area that was technically in the metropolitan area of Beijing because the metropolitan confines of most Chinese cities are much larger, uh, really extending into rural areas uh, than you would consider like in the West or something like that. Um, but anyway, they were kind of, um, uh, I would want to say paycheck to paycheck, but that's not correct. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, you work the land, you live off the land type people that live north of Beijing. Um, you know, uh, they would essentially work three months out of the year. And then in the winter, they would only have enough um, fuel and heat saved up that they could heat one room of their house and specifically... Uh, in these heaters that sat below sort of either like uh, beds or like kind of uh, 
futon type structures um, and they would essentially have to sit inside uh, all winter and uh, only go outside to work the land a little bit in very freezing cold conditions but then come back inside uh, and heat themselves up. Um, something else fascinating about this family that he met uh, whose name again escapes me uh, I could probably look it up it's somewhere in here 123 uh, well anyway they uh, are within the, the Great Wall of China this great you know uh, symbol of the country actually runs through part of their property um, and they kind of uh, it's just fascinating how when Peter would go out there on the weekends, even if he wasn't taking this longer jaunt uh, along the eastern part of the Great Wall, he would still see the, the remoteness of the Great Wall in an unrestored area, essentially in uh, these per people's um, agricultural property. Now that being said, uh, they did work the land, they were uh, farmers, they lived really more in a small um, community of farmers, uh, commune, I guess you'd say, which would imply communist, as it does, uh, that um, maybe had like six or seven houses, and Peter rented a room in one of these houses that he, with these people that he lived with. Uh, and you got to kind of see uh, in the book kind of the um, small-scale uh, um, socio sociological way uh, that these people interacted with one another uh, in this sort of post Mao Zedong, but still nominally communist state. You know, they had the head of the village was uh, still a communist, still reported to her higher up, which would report to that higher up and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until it reached uh, the heights of power, which were about as remote as, you know, the ocean is from Mount Everest. Um, but, uh, you, there was still sort of this uh, vague enforcement of um, every, of community standards, of not necessarily in a way in the West of merely functional, but um, almost like psychological. Like you had to, uh, it wasn't necessarily group mind thinking that they were brainwashed, but there was definitely sort of like a mentality of you serve the, the, the small commune uh, community that you live in rather than being an uh, individual entrepreneur or proprietor uh, or something like that. Um, I'm trying to think. The woman that was the head of this group kind of, there was backbiting and, you know, kind of small town intrigue uh, as you would get in other areas of the world that were uh, relatively a small town. Um, yeah, they definitely led kind of meal by meal I'm trying to think of some of the other things about this family. Uh, he mentioned that the, one of the things they did was raise uh, not coconuts, walnuts. They're not raising coconuts outside of Beijing. That's ridiculous. Uh, walnuts, walnut trees was one of their main crops that they raised. And this actually um, brought a f funny point up to Peter in that he had sort of this nightmare memory of having to get walnuts as a kid. And to show you how sort of... Um, as much as technology has advanced in China, how at least in the agricultural sector, it's still very labor intensive. Um, Peter mentioned that when he was in the United States as a child, uh, his parents took him to pick walnuts. And uh, after a full hard eight hour day's work, they went and sold the walnuts, uh, which sold for, I think maybe like four or five dollars or something like that for um, their entire day's wage. Obviously, in the West, uh, at least in the walnut industry, uh, it's all mechanized uh, on large scale. Uh, but what these people in northern China, um, they're essentially picking these walnuts by hand, uh, using plows through animal labor uh, in some of their other crops. Uh, and it's still very much like labor intensive and just kind of living off the land. Um, with, at such a small survival rate, uh, something that was mentioned in the book is that I believe it was the daughter needed a blood transfusion and essentially not just her, but the entire town uh, freaked out. I think it was a blood trans... No, 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 no. It was either a blood transfusion or it had... Maybe it was leukemia. I think it might have been leukemia. Um, 
But anyway, the whole town freaked out because as bad as healthcare is in the United States and as nominally as there is universal healthcare in China, the truth of the matter is it's not Europe. Uh, access is just not available to most people without huge bribes, without money being paid off. Um, now, they were essentially, I think, able to get some testing done and maybe kind of had, I don't remember exactly, but kind of had the situation turned around. Uh, but it was still very kind of uh, uh, dire, uh, the news to this town that could be devastating if somebody got an illness that needed um, a major type of treatment rather than, you know, some sort of, everybody has health problems, everybody dies, but a health problem where you would, <clears throat> excuse me, succumb much more naturally uh, in old age or something like that. Um, I think I want to be thorough about the, uh, the village area. Uh, yeah, they seemed like really good people, though. They were just, um, uh, oh, uh, something about the land. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, the land it was really fascinating because um, obviously there's no sort of no private property in China uh, under the communist rule. But it's there's this va very vague kind of thing of, you kind of own some stuff or you have some documents that, that say you can farm this area, but uh, you can also have it taken away at any point. You know, if somebody comes and claims to own your land, say in the United States or something like that, I'm just going from the reference that I know. Uh, you know, you go to you go to court. I mean, first of all, you laugh them off if they come came to your, your place. Now, if you're in debt, maybe like a repossession type situation, but no one can just come you know, to Farmer John down the road and say, oh, this is no longer your land anymore. But um, people in China still have that fear. Now, it's become much more stabilized in the post Mao Zedong era, just because I think the communists realized that seizing large amounts of land and moving people around leads to huge amounts of death, like in the Cultural Revolution and stuff. But, <clears throat> and the Great Leap Forward, um, that's more accurate, the Great Leap Forward. Uh, but, there's still that ability. There's still people don't have recourse uh, if the government acts against them. So, uh, you know, again, these people were just living kind of, they weren't really impoverished in the sense that uh, they were going to die the next day, but it was very much kind of like a, like a farm to mouth existence. Um, okay, so the third part is about the factory. And the factory is not around Beijing. The, the third book, The Factory, is actually down in the south. Now, what makes this part interesting is um, how, how the, this is where the change really takes place. Um, a couple things about uh, urban areas in all of China. Uh, there's been huge amounts of trends towards fashion. You know, uh, you see modernized roads. You see just the country is in still in, but particularly during this time period, a giant boom phase. I really feel kind of like the 70s was the last of uh, the Mao Zedong era with all that craziness. The 80s was the starting up of the opening up of capitalism, but it was still very, very early. Um, and, uh, you know, people were happy if they were able to, you know, afford a few different kinds of clothes rather than just their Mao suit. Um, or, you know, uh, access to more bicycles or something like that was uh, encouraged. The 90s was kind of like when the flood started opening up. Um, and you started seeing kind of uh, uh, new growth entrepreneurs kind of uh, in Shanghai in that area. Uh, but it was really the 2000s when uh, it wasn't just kind of like a very small group or uh, that was really kind of becoming, you know, first world citizens. Uh, now, there's still a lot of third world citizens in China, even today, even during this time period. But there was huge amounts of change that were moving people out of this from the sort of farm existence that I described in the third area, or in the second book, uh, to the third book uh, of kind of the hard scrabble life in the factory, but then some of those people moving on to sort of a middle class kind of existence. Um, so, yeah, 
uh, you, still, you see some of that all over China. You see that in Beijing. Uh, you see that in Xi'an. Um, there's lots of new buildings, but really kind of the area that drove all of this was the manufacturing area in Guangzhou and Fujian, as well as a couple other of the uh, southeast provinces of China. Um, kind of some interesting things about this area. It's a, uh, the impression that I really got was kind of the the hard scrabble, um, or not necessarily hard scrabble because that more describes the village, but kind of the um, uh, old west, uh, uh, you know, anything goes mentality of these factories that are set up. Um, a lot of the the products that are made for Western brands are made in this part of China, but like it's most of those brands. I don't think control the factories directly. So there's a lot less kind of oversight in um, what's appropriate behavior for, um, you know, running a factory. Um, a specific example mentioned is the uh, pleather factory. Now this is interesting and something that's kind of trended uh, in the 2010s is manufacturing that's not merely for overseas export, but actually meant to go back into the Chinese economy. Now, what is a pleather factory? It is a factory that produces fake leather um, at a much cheaper cost because obviously you gotta raise cows to, to make leather. It's a synthetic leather, if you will. Um, but kind of what was interesting about this factory was just kind of the, they paid a little bit higher um, because there were a lot of health problems, specifically with the noxious uh, fumes that um, people ingested while going through this and it was actually almost like a uh, old west um, not stare down but like like a, a shootout if you will except there weren't actually guns but kind of a, a showdown uh, in the town that Peter visited because um, a group was trying to I believe get out of this factory but they had signed a contract so rather than just being employed day to day at will, they had signed a contract and they would get in trouble if they did. Well, they kind of all walked out and uh, said, not necessarily that they were um, ultimately trying to change the, well, they were, I guess they were trying to change the factory, but what they really wanted to do was just go walk out and go work for another factory. Um, so there was kind of a, a showdown of these people trying to walk out versus the managers that were trying to keep them on for the uh, agreed contract that they had. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, because the, um, whether it's by choice or by, uh, just, um, uh, it's the way things are, the Chinese government, uh, does not necessarily have, uh, the strongest, um, oversight power, uh, of these factories. I think largely that's by choice because it encourages factories to just kind of make things as they want to, you know, they're less likely to bring manufacturing jobs in if they got, uh, you know, the nanny state looking over their shoulder every minute. Um, so it's really up to these people who can't be unionized, can't, uh, they're really free contractors um, to uh, determine what is best for them. Um, kind of some other things. He talked about a city that had been dammed um, in that area uh and how the water and how everyone was uh, moved out of that area for hydroelectric power um, he talked about how some of the nicest roads in all of china that he drove on it is country driving uh, were in that area um, in order essentially to uh, accommodate trucks or you know various parts of the movement of goods uh, from these factories that were close to the sea but weren't necessarily like right on the docks uh, he said that those roads around were really nice in order to uh, accommodate these people. Um, let's see. I think it's pretty much it. Oh, what kind of I'll end on this funny story. As he's driving through various parts of China, um, he talks about a couple of kind of ridiculous things. I'll tell you this first ridiculous thing, and I'll tell you the second ridiculous thing. The first ridiculous thing is that is, I don't know if you can see it with a glare. You probably can't. That is not a real policeman. Uh, that is a statue and in order to I guess intimidate or uh, encourage drivers to act appropriately on roads in China they put statues of policemen now in the in the West we'd say oh that's a statue and we would uh, 
either obey the laws because we were a good person or not obey the laws uh, because we didn't feel like obeying the laws. But the statue would have no effect. Whereas in China, the just the culture, it's not that they're stupid. It's just the culture is that, that if, if there's even an image of an authority figure, um, you should probably pay attention or you should think at least of what you should do and change your behavior if it's wrong. Whereas I don't know if any statues uh, of policemen in the United States are going to change behavior. Uh, the second kind of funny story, and I'll end on this, is uh, the driver's license. Um, in order to get a driver's license in China, you have to take this very ridiculous test. And a lot of it has to do with, like, um, uh, like an example would be, like, if you pull or if you approach a red light, should you A, slam on your brakes, B, hit your brakes softly so that you slow down and stop at the red light, um, C, continue as you are going through the red light, or D, accelerate through the red light. Uh, <laughs> and, I mean, that was just kind of one example. I can't remember what all of them were, but they're, it's almost like um, um, if a... Uh, somebody, if somebody in some culture had never experienced roads before, and chosen and then read like a book about what roads are and then wrote a driver's license test based on that that's like what the driver's license tests in china are like they're just so uh, hilarious and how kind of misguided they are now china is becoming a new car driving culture but you would think a bureaucracy as large as uh you know like um the driving authority or the licensing authority in all of China would have enough foresight to not ask kind of questions that are just uh, way out of off the pale. So anyway, I'm sure I didn't do this justice. One thing about Peter Hessler is, uh, as I said, you really get a, a perspective of what everyday life is like. You get a perspective of, um, uh, you know, there's there's no, a lot of people that do travel writing, there's a lot of kind of, um, um, filler space or kind of where they're feeding their own uh, ego almost in a way by kind of either regurgitating uh, preconceptions or just kind of, you know, it's not real crisp. Uh, Peter Essler is one of those writers that really writes like of the earth, that really, you know, salt of the earth, uh, understands uh, the intricacies and what's going on and what is really present to uh, the everyday lives of uh, people in China and what is going on and has both the small picture and the larger picture in mind and really gets in there and understands it. So anyway, that's my glowing review. Uh, Country Driving, A Journey Through China from Farm to Factory by Peter Hessler. All right, keep checking out my, my reviews, you guys. All right, goodbye. Bye.